welcome once again, everybody. And a very sincere thanks for coming here to be with us today. A special greetings we send to Frida, Frida McElroy, who cannot be with us today uh, because she had a little fall and um, broke her shoulder and her wrist. And we just pray for God's blessing uh, to go out to Frida. And I also welcome those who are joining us on YouTube. And we remember you every day in Mass, just as I remember the readers and promoters of the Curate's Diary every day in Mass. And our vision is that through what we do here, and through the Curate's Diary, and through the, the YouTube, that we'll be able to start a little flow of blessing and renewal that would well spread out from here. Today, incidentally, is the Feast of... What's it today, the Feast of? Pardon. It's going to be missed because it's a Sunday, the Feast of All the Saints of Ireland. Oh. And the uh, 6th of November. Could you safely say that there were members of your family who loved the Lord? Would that be true to say? Where are they? They're in heaven. If anybody loves the Lord and sincerely repents of sin, the title of one of my booklet, books is, I want to go to heaven the moment I die. And that is God's will for us, that we'd be able to go to heaven the very moment we die. And today we celebrate a feast day of, perhaps it's your mother, perhaps it's your father, perhaps it's your grandparents, uh, great-grandparents, uncles, aunts. Those who love the Lord and sought to walk in his ways, they are in heaven. In the early church, they had a practice of getting baptized on behalf of the dead. Now, why would you get baptized on behalf of the dead? Uh, these were people whose parents and grandparents hadn't a chance to know Jesus. They weren't, my parents weren't part of the chosen, um, the chosen nation, as it was called. So their parents would have been pagans. And they got baptized on behalf of the dead. Uh, why? Because in baptism, we are united with the death and resurrection of Jesus. St. Paul said to them in the early church, If there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? So St. Paul gave this as living proof. The fact that people were getting baptized for the dead, he gave it as living proof of the resurrection. Now, in baptism, we had the opportunity to be united with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then as we go through life, we were baptized as infants and we couldn't know anything about it at the time. And so as we go through life, the challenge is to become open to the graces of our baptism. Aren't you aware that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in the newness of life. In baptism, we have the opportunity to be united with Jesus in his death, to rise with him in his resurrection. And so they got baptized on behalf of the dead who hadn't a chance to be baptized, getting baptized on behalf of the dead, interceding that their dead family members would become open to the death and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, that our dead family members who hadn't a chance to know the Lord, who hadn't a chance to be baptized, that they too would be saved. Now, there are two other sacraments which in a special way give us the opportunity to be united with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Can anybody tell me which two they are? In fact, there's three, but there's two in particular. Anybody else to tell me? In every Mass, the death and resurrection of Jesus is made present. And so when we offer Mass for the dead, we are doing, in a sense, something very similar to what they did in the early church when they got baptized on behalf of the dead. The most important element of the Mass on this altar today, the death of Jesus will be made present. The resurrection of Jesus will be made present. 
And Jesus will invite you to be united with him in his death and resurrection made present in the Mass. And that, then what might the second sacrament be that gives us a special opportunity to be united with the death and resurrection of Jesus? Confession. Confession where we go, uh, confessing our sins, seeking to be united within ourselves with the death of Jesus in order to share more fully in the power of his resurrection. And that is why confession is another very special sacrament that we can offer for a beloved dead. Because we're offering our being united with the death and resurrection of Jesus just as in the early church, in getting baptized on behalf of the dead, they were offering their being united through baptism. Although they were already baptized, they are being united through baptism with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, what do you think is the first and most challenging thing that souls have to do in purgatory? The first and most challenging thing that souls have to do in purgatory <coughs> is face the truth about our lives. That is the first and most difficult task. And if there are souls in purgatory, and visionaries tell us that there are, if there are souls in purgatory who have been in purgatory for a prolonged period, why is that? Because they haven't been able to face the truth about their lives. Haven't been able to face the truth about their sinfulness. Haven't been able to face the truth about the hurt that they caused here on earth. And I can tell you this. Nobody, nobody enters heaven without having faced the truth about our lives. Or at least having a sincere desire to face the truth about their lives. And that is why confession is a most powerful sacrament. Because in confession, every time, if we approach confession with a sincere desire to face the truth about our lives, it prepares us for entry into heaven. And if we offer up our confession in intercession for our beloved dead, what we're really offering up is a prayer to us acknowledging our sins, a prayer that our beloved dead will be able to face the truth about their lives. And that is the very first essential for everybody as regards going to heaven, but also for the souls in purgatory. If they reach the stage of being able to face the truth about their lives, then they can make progress. Until souls in purgatory receive the grace to face the truth about their lives, then they're stuck. It's going to be a slow process. If I met a person who's unable to face the truth about his or her life, we have, haven't we? Uh, Psalm 36 uh, says, there is no fear of God before the eyes of the wicked person, for his eyes are too full of conceit to detect or hate his own sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and well-doing. Even on his bed he plots wickedness. He sets himself on the path that is not good. He fails to reject evil. And there are people like that here on earth, aren't there? All too many. Think of all the terrible things happening in the world. Terrible, terrible things. Think of, sadly, of the leadership of Russia and Patriot Kirill and all those. Unable to face the truth about their lives. And thinking they're serving God when it's far from God that they're serving. But once we face the truth about our lives, then St. John says... If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, <coughs> he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Make note of that. If we 
confess our sins. In other words, if we face the truth about our lives, I'm not talking about going into confession and not facing the truth about our lives. An absolutely key element of our spiritual journey is to be willing to face the truth about our lives. Could I exalt you, exhort you today to make it as a special decision here in Glendalough this day that you have a desire to face the truth about your life. Is that something that we, I could ask of all of you? Okay. Hands up those who are willing to have a desire to face the truth about our, li at our lives. Now, it doesn't mean we'll be successful. But if we have an absolute, sincere desire to face the truth about our lives, then that, that works. If we have an absolute, sincere desire to face the truth about our own sinfulness and to open our sinfulness to God, then you can rest easy. And the Holy Spirit will guide you and prompt you as you go through life as to what more you need to face the truth about. But having a sincere desire to face the truth about one's own sinfulness, to face the truth about one's own life, to face the truth about people into whose life we have brought hurt or disappointment. That is an absolute essential for being able to go to heaven. And without that, we cannot go to heaven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So isn't that a crucial uh, one way or the other? That if we have a sincere desire to face the truth about our lives, and then <coughs> today, as we're offering our confession for the dead today, having a sincere desire, first of all, that we ourselves will face the truth about our lives, and then having a sincere desire that our beloved dead will face the truth about our lives. So we offer up our seeking to face the truth about our lives. We offer up that uh, for uh, the souls in purgatory. In the process, we are becoming more open to God. And so are becoming more open to God. Please, God, will help our departed brothers and sisters, if they are still in purgatory, to take a step towards becoming open to the light and becoming open to God. Now, the second thing which souls in purgatory have to do, I don't know whether they completed in purgatory or not, but the second thing which souls in purgatory have to do before entry in, into heaven, what do you think it is? It is to do what's in their power to make up for the hurt that they caused in this life. And how can they do that? The only way open to them in purgatory is through prayer, intercession. Now, different visionaries have had, and some, some visionaries may not be visionaries at all, be aware of that. Uh, sometimes people claim visions that may not be of the Lord. But some visionaries, have you ever come across a visionary or a book by a visionary and it gives you this absolutely terrifying uh, appearance of purgatory? Have you ever come across that? Um, where it's made out to be an utterly, utterly dreadful place altogether. Now, I would say to you that perhaps different visionaries see different levels in purgatory. And just as if somebody came on earth t t today, and if a person he came here to Ireland, they might report back, earth is a lovely place. But if a person um, came on earth and came into the heart of Africa where there's famine and people dying of hunger, uh, they might report back that earth is a terrible place. And so too, I would suggest, it's possible that some visionaries have seen the more terrifying elements of purgatory and think that that's all that there is to purgatory. And some visionaries have seen the more pleasant elements of purgatory and think purgatory is a wonderful place, a lovely place. St. Catherine of Genoa, she speaks about the joy of purgatory. 
And do remember that. Oh, there's one thing we can say about all the souls in purgatory, and that is that they are saved. Never forget that. All the souls in purgatory are saved. They still have some work to do, but they are saved. No soul in purgatory is destined to be lost. Can we say that the same about souls here on earth? That no soul here on earth is destined to be lost. We can't say that, can we? But we can say it about the souls in purgatory. No soul in purgatory is destined to be lost. And I would say to you that any soul in purgatory who has reached the stage of being able to face the truth about their own sinfulness, the truth about their lives, to come in repentance to God, that they can move on then uh, to what might be called the happier areas of purgatory. Using the word area, it's not, there's no areas in purgatory, but uh, using it of spiritual realities. And I would invite you to think of, suppose you have a pleasant outing coming up, perhaps when you are preparing to come here to God's cottage today, or if you're going to Lourdes or somewhere like that, and you know you have work to do before you can make the journey. Um, and that work may involve a bit of pressure, it may involve a bit of bother, it may be a bit tedious, but you know you have work to do before you can make the journey. But yet you're happy because you're no, you know you're going to a happy place. And the souls in purgatory who have faced the truth about their lives know that they're going to a very happy place. And uh, they still may have work to do in purgatory. I don't know whether they can complete the intercession in heaven or not. I don't know that. But I do believe that the first element or the second element of purgatory is beginning to make deep intercession for any person or any family into whose life one has brought hurt or disappointment. And so today, as we go to confession, I would just like you to come with that attitude that you desire to face the full truth about your life, the full truth about whatever sins you have committed, the full truth about whose lives, into whose lives you have brought hurt or disappointment. And to make that sort of part of your examination of conscience, and then coming to confession, offering up your going to confession uh, for uh, your deceased relatives and friends, or whoever you feel led to pray for, and I will allow you to make one little, diff a little change to the sacrament confession today. Uh, before I give you, after you complete your sins, before I give the absolution, uh, I leave the opening there for you to say one sentence, I'm offering my confession for. And if there's somebody whose eternal welfare you're particularly worried about, you can name that person or you can just say to deceased members of your family, you don't go into details, we haven't time for to go into details uh, as to why, but you can just put in the sentence, I am offering my confession for could be your own deceased family members, or it could be somebody in particular. And we pray for that grace for you to be able to come to confession today with a sincere desire to face the full truth about your life, with a sincere desire to be able to recognize anybody into whose life you have ever brought hurt or disappointment, and with a sincere desire to offer your confession this day for your deceased relatives or for some people in particular. And we ask this through Christ our Lord.